Colin, from last week's uh, uplifting seminar about Southern Rambo uh, information and the tropics. Uh, today we're continuing on with a little South American theme. Jimmy McGuire, on behalf of um, his collaborators, is telling us about diversification of home Thank you. Jim. Oh, great. Oh, thank you. I'm here. <laughs> So believe it or not, I'm the curator of herpetology in the, uh, in the MVZ, but I'm going to talk about hummingbirds today. And I figure there were a fair number of people in the museum who had no idea that I actually work on hummingbirds as well as reptiles and amphibians. Uh, and also, you know, I've talked about a lot of my herpetological work at various uh, times here in the MVZ. And, uh, and I hadn't talked about hummingbirds work yet really since I arrived here, so this seemed like a good time to, uh, to bust it out, so to speak. So <clears throat> as you can see from the title, the diver it's uh, Diversification of Hummingbirds in Altitude, Physiological Challenges of Flight Shape Hummingbird Evolution at High Elevations. And we're really focusing now on trying to understand how hummingbirds deal with, uh, with the unavailability or reduced availability of oxygen at high elevation. But as we'll see in a moment, this work actually is a logical extension of work that we started previously, looking at uh, the basics of flight performance across these same sorts of elevational gradients. So th the first thing I want to do is thank my collaborators, because uh, really these are the people that uh, either got the ball rolling or are basically doing the lion's share of the work now. Uh, the first of which is Chris Witt. And many of you know Chris because he was a postdoc here in the MVZ and he initiated this work, the, the hemoglobin work and the, the physiological performance work <coughs> uh, while he was a uh, postdoc here and now he's a professor at the University of New Mexico. And he's really doing the heavy lifting on the, uh, the results that I'll be talking about today. And then Doug Altschuler, who some of you may know, Doug and I go way back, he was a PhD student of Robert Dudley's when they were at Texas. And then he was a postdoc here with Michael Dickinson before Michael Dickinson uh, took off for Caltech. And then, uh, of course, the third uh, collaborator here is our own illustrious Robert Dudley hanging from a tree. And uh, he's been involved in every aspect of, uh, of the program, sort of from the beginning through the present. So when I talk about the, the hummingbird system, I like to sort of take it back to square one and talk about the set of experiments that convinced me that hummingbirds would be a really fascinating system with which to study uh, a variety of evolutionary phenomena. And so I'd like to go back to this set of classic studies that were undertaken in Robert's lab while he was still at the University of Texas. And he undertook these, uh, these studies with, with his postdoc, Peng Chai, and with Doug Altschuler, who is a you know, co-author on, uh, on this talk. <clears throat> and in this uh, set of experiments, they took ruby-throated hummingbirds, Archilocus colubris, which is the typical hummingbird, the one species which occurs regularly in the eastern half of the United States, a lowland species, and they subjected them to a variable density gas mixture. And they had all sorts of questions that they were interested in, in addressing uh, by doing this. Uh, but, but there was one in particular that was, uh, that was most fascinating to me and that sort of led to my involvement in the, in the research here. And I'll get to that in a moment. So what they actually did is they took these ruby thirty hummingbirds, they brought them into the laboratory, they made a, a plexiglass sealed enclosure, right? And inside this enclosure, hummingbirds, you can put them in there and they'll just hover. It's the remarkable thing about hummingbirds that they'll just behave immediately, so you can do all sorts of things with them with, in terms of their flight physiology and such, because they'll hover in a small space. So they, brought, they made these chambers, they brought the hummingbirds in, they could put them in there. They trained them to come to a feeder inside the chamber, so the hummingbirds would come in and feed the feeder periodically. And, uh, and then they put a mask on the feeder, and they connected that mask to an oxygen analyzer. And so the birds would come in to feed at the feeder, they'd be hovering there, and they could measure their oxygen consumption in real time as they were feeding at the, hover, at, the, at the feeder. Pretty wild, right? So they were actually able to measure oxygen metabolism in hummingbirds in the laboratory. And then they could also uh, put a video camera, they could aim a video camera at the feeder, and they could put a little mirror there so that they could actually see three-dimensional, what's going on in the three dimensions, and they could look at the flight kinematics, so that they could look at the wing beat stroke amplitudes, they could look at wing beat frequencies, while the birds were hovering at the feeder while they were measuring their metabolism. And then just to make it even more elegant, they could change the density and the oxygen concentration inside the chamber by using variable density gas mixtures. So they could manipulate it any way they wanted. They could make the air hyper dense, and, uh, but with the same amount of oxygen in it, and see how that affected things. They could make the air hyper dense, less dense by using helium, by using helium, which would reduce the air density to mimic higher elevations. They could keep oxygen constant. They could manipulate oxygen. They could do all these things. They answered all kinds of interesting questions with this system. But the one that was most interesting to me was that when they reduced, when they made the, the inside of the chamber the equivalent of high elevations, uh, they actually determined why hummingbirds uh, failed, why they could no longer hover at a particular elevational equivalent. And what they found with ruby threaded hummingbird was that it's at, the air, at the elevational equivalent of 6,000 meters, at that air density, the birds couldn't hover any longer. Now you might ask the question, you know, why not? What, what do hummingbirds actually do in response to, uh, to hypodense air? 
as a response, a behavioral response. And I would have just guessed, you know, a priori, oh, they must flap their wings faster. Right? They, it, that seems like a logical way to to to, uh, to to compensate. But in fact, they really didn't. They they flapped a little bit faster. But their primary means of compensation was by increasing their wing beak stroke amplitudes. And if you know about hummingbirds, you know that when they're hovering, they basically have a horizontal stroke, and it's both a powered up stroke and a powered down stroke. So they do this little figure eight, right, like this. And so it's powered in both directions. And what they found was that when the air density was low enough, the wing beat stroke amplitudes continued to increase. And when it was 180 degrees, when they hit the geometric limit, when the wing tips were hitting front and back, then they had no more excess capacity, and they had fallen to the bottom of the enclosure. And then if you increase the air density, then they can hover again. Right? That's a pretty wild finding. And uh, in ruby-throated hummingbirds, a lowland species, they suffered failure when the air was equivalent to, to 6,000 meters. Now, an interesting fact is that you know, hummingbirds achieve their greatest diversities in high elevation habitats, in particular in association with the Andes in South America. And this is a diverse group, right? So there are about 325 to 330 species, and the lion's share of that diversity occurs in association with the Andes, and much of it is at mid to high elevations. That's where you find the largest number of species. And this uh, graph, this, this figure taken from Robick and Graves' uh, PNAS paper in 2000, shows the diversity gradient for hummingbirds across South America. And it's pretty radical if you actually look at this thing and you think about the numbers, you look at the scale, right? You can see that the concentration of species is associated with the Andes, especially the northern Andes. And in some of these pixels, there are 80 species of hummingbirds. Right? I mean, it's pretty wild. You find hummingbirds in, in uh, but many, many hummingbird species in Sympatry at various sites. So at one site, you can find as many as 30 species, which is pretty wild. And uh, at some of these sites at, at uh, mid to high elevations in the Andes, over the course of 50 miles or so, you can find as many as you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of 80 species. A pretty, uh, a pretty amazing uh, fact. Now, I think that it's um, paradoxical that hummingbirds, maybe that's a too strong a term, but I like to use it anyway. It's paradoxical that hummingbirds actually are most diverse at these high elevation sites, in part for the reasons we just saw with the Heliox study. Right? It should be difficult for hummingbirds to fly in these high elevation environments. That's the place where it ought to be most difficult. So um, the high elevation. I think of the high elevation environment as basically a triple challenge for hummingbirds, right? or for really for any birds that are flying. It's cold at high elevations. They have to be able to deal with that. We'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. There's reduced air densities, equivalent to what we saw with the Heliox experiments. And there's also reduced oxygen availability at those elevations. So there are lower oxygen partial pressures. Nevertheless, 80 of 325 hummingbird species uh, reach altitudes above 3,000 meters, where, there's a, where they're exposed to a 30% reduction in oxygen partial pressures which would make it harder for them to, to, uh, to uh, <clears throat> provide oxygen to their tissues. And then 12 taxa actually re reach altitudes above 4,500 meters. And those species would be experiencing a 45% reduction in oxygen partial pressures. So it's pretty wild that hummingbirds are doing this. Now, th there's a logical thing that you would do after uh, seeing the heliox results and then recognizing all this diversity in South America, particularly at high elevations, and that would be to do a comparative study of hummingbirds across those elevational gradients. And that was basically the next step in the process. And uh, Doug Altshuler took the lead on this. This was his dissertation work uh, while he was at, at Texas. And he basically did a bunch of experiments, but I'll just talk about two of them. They, you know, they went in the field. They sampled hummingbirds across all these elevations. They had a great elevational transect in Peru. And it, it, along this one road, which begins at about 400 meters and ends at about 4,500 meters, there are 55 species of hummingbirds. That's pretty cool for a comparative biologist. That's the kind of that's the kind of road you'd like to be able to work on, and um, and so he was able to sample along this road and in some other sites as well. And he did two kinds of experiments. He just brought the birds into it, put them in an enclosure, and videotaped them hovering to see how they responded to um, to the altitude where they were actually naturally occurring. Uh, and then he also did these load lifting trials, which is a really cool way to try to get around the problem of not being able to bring heliox into the field. Right. It's a pretty difficult thing to do, to do heliox trials uh, in, in a field camp. And he found with the first set of experiments that the hummingbirds were actually responding behaviorally in much the same way that ruby throated hummingbirds responded to heliox. So they increased their wing beat stroke amplitudes. Okay. And, uh, and, with the, uh, and then he also found through morphological study that there's, of course, you know, the opportunity for evolutionary response to high elevation when you're looking across species. You know, when you look at ruby throated hummingbird, they basically just have a behavior response available to them, right? To try to deal with with suddenly being confronted with reduced air air density. But when you look at species across evolutionary time, then they can have selection acting on them to modify other aspects of their biology that would allow them to uh, to deal with the problem. And it turns out with hummingbirds, there are morphological innovations that are associated with occurrence at high elevation. He found that wing size actually 
uh, is larger, proportionally larger, in high elevation species. So there's a positive correlation between relative wing size and, uh, and elevation. And uh, consequently, wing loading was actually, is actually lower in those high elevation species, which should make it easier for them to hover in that hypodense air. Another interesting finding, actually, is that it turns out that hummingbirds, we would predict that hummingbirds would get smaller as you go to higher elevation, because that would work more favorably toward this wing loading argument. But it turns out that hummingbirds get larger as you go from lower to higher elevations. And that's probably associated with the thermal requirements, right? Thermal regulation. Nevertheless, wing size increases at an even faster rate than body size, and so wing loading actually goes down as you go from low to, high, to higher elevations. And one of the findings from the, from the load lifting trial was that these birds at, at higher elevation have excess, have reduced excess power capacity, which, without trying to get into the details of, exp of explaining exactly what power is, means that they have less in reserve for extreme flight activities, like burst flight behavior, taking evasive action from predators, you know, chasing other males, you know, that sort of thing. So <clears throat> morphologically, we know, and behaviorally, uh, these birds were responding to a current at high elevation. I love to look at this picture. And when we think about birds, you know, these, these high elevation hummingbirds, these birds occurring essentially in alpine environments, um, in the tropics, but we don't often imagine a situation, you know, like this. But this is actually hummingbird habitat, right? This is hummingbird habitat in the summer, where it can basically, you know, snow any time of year. And you look at that and you think, well, where are the hummingbirds? Well, it turns out that the hummingbirds are over here, where the fuchsias are. So that you know, they have hummingbird syndrome plants way up at high elevation in the Andes, even in this you know amounts to sort of an Arctic environment, with at least two or three species of hummingbirds occurring year-round in those habitats that are feeding at and pollinating uh, those flowers. So when we talk about you know high elevation adaptation in hummingbirds, I mean it's extreme, right? They're way up there in uh, environments that wouldn't be food too fun to live in ourselves. So we can just sort of restate the the, uh, the challenges of, of life at high altitude, and and then specifically why they're I would think of them as even more extreme challenges when it comes to hummingbirds versus other birds, and what we know about how hummingbirds have adapted. So we can start off with, our, this is our sort of our trifecta, why it's difficult to live at high elevation. It's cold at high elevation. Obviously, from the picture there, you can see that it's likely to be cold there. It was certainly cold at the place I did field work recently in Peru. Um, there's hypodense air. This presents problems for hummingbirds, or any bird. And there's low oxygen partial pressure. Right. So what we really want to know is how birds, and when we started out with this study, we wanted to understand how the birds could actually deal with these sorts of problems. And although we haven't been directly investigating uh, cold, there are some explanations for how hummingbirds are actually dealing with it. So the reason why cold would, would seem to be a particular challenge for hummingbirds is because they're so small relative to other vertebrates. Right? So that, in fact, the smallest endotherms are actually hummingbirds. And most of the species are on the small side, like three to five grams. So they're little tiny guys where thermal regulation is going to be an issue for them. And so occurrence in cold climates should be challenging for them. They've uh, evolved a number of, a couple of responses to this. One, of course, we've already alluded to, there seems to be this increase in body size over the elevational gradient. But the more important one, I think, is the daily torpor. So the birds at these elevations would have a hard time uh, maintaining their body temperature. They can preserve or, uh, or reserve their, uh, their energy by going into daily torpor each day, right? That conserves uh, resources for them and allows them to, uh, to deal with the cold climate and behavioral thermoregulation for endothermia. So um, <clears throat> hypodense air, of course, is the second problem. And this is the one that we've already um, addressed from the standpoint of the flight biomechanics, the kinematics, and uh, to some extent, the morphology as well. And of course, hummingbirds exhibit the, they, they utilize the most energetically demanding mode of flight. I didn't really point to this, but in the Heliox studies, one of the things they showed was that hummingbirds have the highest mass-specific metabolic rate of any vertebrate. Right? That's one of the things you can measure when you're, when you're uh, measuring oxygen consumption in a, in a chamber like that. So because they're utilizing the most energetically demanding mode of flight, hypodense air should be particularly difficult for them to deal with. And now we know from what, what I've already told you that they've been able to deal with this through increased wing beat stroke amplitudes across these uh, elevational gradients, and also in reduced wing disc loadings, right? relatively larger wings. Uh, proportionally larger wings have reduced their wing loadings, and therefore that's a second way that they can that they can compensate in in, uh, in part for hypodense air. And then, of course, the last uh, topic is low partial pressure of oxygen, right? And we imagine that this is a, a a big problem for hummingbirds, right? Because they have the highest mass specific metabolic rate, which means they're utilizing enormous oxygen uh, volumes in order to to uh, uh, for for uh, for their metabolism and. Uh, so we would expect that this would pre present a particularly uh, great problem for them. And this is, of course, what we're really interested in, right? And, of course, we don't know 
at this stage how hummingbirds are actually dealing with this, what sorts of specializations or adaptations they might have that allow them to deal with low oxygen partial pressures despite the fact that they have these enormous oxygen requirements. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And so that's the, this is sort of the background that led us up to the, uh, the, our current program. So the goal of uh, the project and the talk today is to try to understand high altitude adaptation in hummingbirds, particularly with respect to, ox to low oxygen availability, by integrating data on phylogeny, molecular evolution of, re of respiratory proteins, and, hor and whole organism physiology. And we're going to talk about each of these three things today. And we're still sort of in the middle of this project, so we, don't, we, have, we aren't able to, to neatly tie all these things together. But I think that I can show you that uh, each of these uh, components has some interesting things to say about high altitude adaptation in hummingbirds. Hopefully I can convince you of that. So we'll start off with the phylogeny, and I don't want to belabor it, even though it's, you know, I've been working on it for years. Um, so we're working on molecular phylogeny. It's a multi-locus. Uh, we're taking the multi-locus approach. So our data set uh, to date includes two mitochondrial genes, the protein coding genes, ND2 and ND4. We have four autosomal loci, uh, some introns, AK1, beta fibrinogen. We have ODC, and we have the alpha globin subunit of hemoglobin. Uh, and then we have one Z-linked locus, musk, and for uh, 290 of the 300 and roughly 330 species, we're obtaining these sequences. Um, and we have nearly complete sequence data for all but uh, ODC and alpha globin. So eventually we'll have them, you know, we'll have all of them and more. So this isn't a, a tree showing that 290 species. Um, I could produce a tree like that, but I really wanted to take this opportunity to showcase this phylogeny that we just published in Systematic Biology uh, a couple of months ago. So this is a phylogeny for, it's based on, a, on partition Bayesian analysis of those loci, of several of those loci that I showed you, not all of them actually, based on, on uh, ND2 and ND4 and beta fibrinogen and AK1. And, uh, and this is for a subset, 151 species. And, um, we were able to find that there are nine primary clades of hummingbirds, if you include Patagona as uh, the giant hummingbird as its own clade, a one species clade. Um, and without talking too much about the tree, I'll just point out that one, one of the more interesting phylogenetic findings, which doesn't really relate to the physiology story, is that um, contrary to the traditional sort of view of hummingbird phylogeny, it's broken down into two subfamilies, the Pheophornithini, the hermits, and then the Trochilini, the rest of the hummingbirds. Uh, it looks like uh, that traditional classification doesn't really match the phylogeny. So we have this group that we refer to as topazes. There's actually four species, two in each of the genera, Florisid and Topaza, which in each of our phylogenetic analyses continually comes out as the sister taxon to the rest of the group, which is kind of cool because people have assumed that um, that a lot of the things that we sort of care, that we think about when we, when we uh, consider hummingbirds as being like characteristic features actually evolved within the hummingbird lineage, within the, tro the trochilines, because the Thethornithines, the hermits, don't exhibit vibrant coloration, they're not territorial, they, they don't have iridescence, those sorts of things. Those things all seem to be an innovation of trochility, but now it suggests that maybe that, that sort of view of the evolution of hummingbirds was, um, was off a little. I have to admit that that, that node is not super strongly supported. So we may be back to the traditional view at some point soon. <laughs> so in that study, we also, um, it, we didn't make a big deal about it in our paper. We, we mentioned it, but we didn't make a big deal about it. So in that paper, we also did some ancestral stage reconstructions, and we were looking at things like uh, Andean occurrence and, uh, and uh, some biogeographical issues. But one of the things we were also interested in, of course, was um, elevational occurrence, and trying to reconstruct the invasion of high elevation habitats in hummingbirds. And so this shows um, a square change parsimony analysis, which is actually a maximum likelihood analysis, despite the name, of, um, of minimum elevational currents in hummingbirds. And this is the, the sort of uh, the backbone tree with all nine major groups indicated on it with the ancestral state reconstructions at each node. And then this is uh, just homing in on one of those groups, the coquettes, which I should have mentioned is part of a group of hummingbirds that we refer to as the Andean clade, coquettes plus brilliance, they're a monophyletic assemblage, which are almost all associated with the Andes. And many of the super high elevation lineages occur within that particular uh, pair of groups, uh, pair of taxa. So here's the coquettes again. And what we basically see here is that the, the Andean clade, coquettes plus brilliance, does have a, a higher elevational uh, reconstruction. These are minimum elevational reconstructions. So if you were doing maximum, you'd see a lot more orange and red on there. But if you look at the coquettes themselves, you see that there's a lot of variation in terms of elevational occurrence. And, uh, and But most of the lineages are high especially like all these guys up here, with some that are super high, like Oreotrochilus and Oxypogon here. And these taxa will come back into 
into view when we're looking at some of the hemoglobin work. So this just shows that there's lots of variation, but that there's also been um, uh, invasion, multiple invasions at super high elevation sites. Now another way we can look at our phylogeny is in the form of a chronogram. So this is a multi digit chronogram, and uh, it includes more than 150 species. It includes uh, like 270 of the species in this case. And one of the things that you can see just from your a casual perusal of the chronogram is that hummingbirds appear to go back about 35 million years, the crown group. That's uh, what we estimate. So they've been around for about 35 million. And you can plot onto the tree those lineages that occur above 3,000 meters, right, which we arbitrarily can, you know, uh, infer to be high elevation or, uh, or argue to be uh, high elevation. <clears throat> and you can see that there are these orange branches all over the tree here. And if you count them up, it looks like, according to this tree, that there are about 13 different independent invasions of high elevation habitats. If you take a conservative view, um, you would say that there are at least 11 and probably more independent invasions of high elevation habitats among hummingbirds. So that's pretty cool, right? I mean, if you're interested in comparative biology, and you've got all these replicated natural experiments, uh, then you can actually do something statistically if you're trying to study adaptation to high elevation habitats, because you have all these replicated invasions of high elevation habitats. You might be wondering, well, what's the, to set the, the time frame for a peak Andean uplift? And here it is, plotted on the, on the uh, chronogram here. So between 12 and 5 million years ago is the period of peak Andean uplift. And you can see that uh, a lot of hummingbird diversification seems to be sort of tied up in that period. And of course, there are a lot of species in the Andes that might very well have evolved during peak Andean uplift. But some of these high elevation lineages seem to predate uh, this, uh, the, the peak uplift period for, uh, for the mountains. And I'll just let you think about that. I'll move on. Jim, which is the Andean clade there? The Andean clay is coquettes plus brilliance. <clears throat> With a lot of diversification there. All right, so that's the phylogenetic framework. And the key point that I want you to remember is that we've had multiple invasions of high elevation habitats in, in hummingbirds. So the second thing that, I, that I'm going to talk about, the second part of the talk is the, the study of the molecular evolution of respiratory proteins. And we're focusing our attention at this stage on hemoglobin. <clears throat> and eventually, we'd also like to, be, to look at, at myoglobin as well. And of course, hemoglobin. And you can imagine if you're inter interested in, in adaptation to high elevation in a species that has a high metabolic rate, the hemoglobin will be the, the first protein you'd probably want to investigate. Because it's hemoglobins, of course, that bind oxygen in the lungs and deliver them to the tissues. Right? So it's obviously going to play a key role in this. The, the molecule itself is a tetramer comprised of two alpha chain and two beta chain subunits. And it turns out that in birds and in hummingbirds, you know, and we assume in hummingbirds, there are seven hemoglobin subunits, so three adult uh, adult subunits, two alpha subunits, and a beta subunit, and then four embryonic subunits. And I don't personally know how embryonic uh, hemoglobin benefits any bird, to be honest, given that they're sitting there in, a, uh, in an egg. But we're planning on sequencing all of these. So we have a grant to, for this project, and the grant basically includes sequencing all seven of these subunits plus myoglobin for all 290 species, plus some interspecific sampling for species that we're particularly interested in that span a big elevational gradient. Right now, we don't have that much data, but we, we hope to get there. So before we talk about our, uh, our data and our results, I thought I would uh, point out a couple of case studies of molecular adaptation of, of high altitude hemoglobin. These are fantastic studies, actually, and the classic examples of, of, uh, of hemoglobin high altitude, adapta high altitude adaptation. So uh, bar-headed goose is one that many of you have probably heard of. This is a goose species which occurs in Asia, and it migrates every year over the Himalayas. So these things have been seen flying over the summit of Mount Everest. So they're flying way up there in uh, oxygen-deprived environments. Now, Perutz published a paper in 1983 uh, where they indicated that they found a unique amino acid substitution in bar-headed goose. Now, Perutz had already won the Nobel Prize for his work on hemoglobin structure, and so uh, he knew a little bit about hemoglobin. And he argued, based on the expected conformational changes in the, in the, in the protein, that uh, these, this, the specific amino acid site substitution that he had detected would expose more of the heme and therefore allow for increased oxygen binding affinity. So that was his argument. Now, a second study was undertaken. This one for Andean goose by Heibel et al. in 1987. Very cool goose. We saw some of these at our previous <coughs> site, actually. So we were up there living with the Andean geese. Um, these guys have a different unique amino acid substitution, but, but Heibel et al. argued based on the same sort of logic as Perutz, that it would actually cause the same conformational change in the hemoglobin and would therefore also likely result in an increase in oxygen binding affinity. So different amino acid substitution causing the same effect on the hemoglobin structure and therefore increasing oxygen binding. Of course, you might not want to take at face value that 
that they're right and only does increase oxygen binding affinity. And so Jessen et al. came along in 1991, and they altered human hemoglobin using site-directed mutagenesis that confirmed experimentally that both of the substitutions that have been documented for bar-headed goose and for Andean goose did, in fact, increase oxygen binding affinity and did so without affecting other hemoglobin properties. Pretty cool <laughs> series of studies there. So there's good reason to think that hemoglobins are likely targets of selection when, uh, when birds are adapting to high elevation habitats. So we can ask the question again, why study humming, you know, hemoglobins of hummingbirds? And uh, I would make the case that the hummingbirds are an even cooler system, an even more powerful system to, to study uh, hemoglobin evolution uh, than, the, than the geese because we have these replicated events, right? So we have at least 11 independent invasions of high elevation habitats. Furthermore, they're up there in low oxygen partial pressure environments, but they also have this super high metabolic rate. So you expect that they would be even more challenged, that there would be even stronger selection on these guys to um, to uh, compensate for uh, occurrence uh, in those elevations. So strong selection pressure on efficient O2 uptake and delivery to metabolizing tissues. So how about our data? So we have some preliminary data for, uh, for hemoglobins, for hummingbirds. We've got the hemoglobin alpha A subunit sequence for, for about 200 species of hummingbirds. So it's not the whole set, and it's not all the units, but it's enough for us to, uh, to do some interesting analyses, or I think they're interesting. Um, we found that in the alpha-A subunit that 21 of the 141 amino acid positions are variable, and there are 14 sites that have one or more unique amino acid substitutions or replacements that are specific to high-altitude lineages. So it looks like these amino acid substitutions are concentrated in the lineages you'd expect them to be concentrated in, the ones that are at high elevation. And we can look at this. You know, by, by plotting these substitutions on a phylogeny. So these are, uh, I'll just show you a few examples of amino acid substitutions we've detected and where they, where they, uh, where they fall out on the phylogeny and in the elevations of these, uh, of these clades. So here we see two uh, amino acid positions within the alpha-A subunit, position 14 and position 16, which undergo substitutions in brilliance. So this is the brilliance clade here. And you can see that the substitution appears to occur in the same, at the same node on the tree, in the same common ancestor. And if our phylogeny is right, it actually looks like it reverses back to the original uh, plesiomorphic state, at, again, at the same spot on the tree in both cases. Perhaps these two subunits are, in, are, are uh, correlated. And we can ask whether or not it's possible, you know, this, is, this would be pretty cool if the phylogeny is robust, but these are actually some pretty weakly supported branches, and it's possible that this is just one event, which is still interesting, but it's not necessarily a reversal. Now here's a, a, a figure showing the elevations of these lineages. And so what we see is that these lineages that, the contrast isn't so great here, but basically anybody who's yellow is high. And if it's orange or red, then it's super high. And what we see is that you know, down here, where the substitution occurred in this common ancestor, um, we're basically looking at a high elevation lineage. And the ones that actually appear to have the reversal but might not be part of the monophyletic group um, are lowland. Right? These are relatively low compared to the others, but they're green branches. So it looks like the substitutions that occurred at position 14 and 16 in brilliance are correlated with occurrence in a, a high elevation lineage. Then we see another example. This is at position 9 now, and here we're looking at hot, super high altitude coquettes. This one, the phylogeny is, is uh, well resolved and well supported. And what we see is convergent evolution of a proline to alanine substitution at position 9 in Oreotrochilus. I mentioned these guys before. It's a super high elevation taxon. And also in oxypogon plus chalca stigma. Right, which is, again, another super high elevation uh, lineage. So it looks like we have a convergent substitution happening in these two lineages that are way up there. And when you look at the phylogeny, you can see that these are, in fact, part of high elevation lineages. Okay. So, you know, I mean, that doesn't definitively tell you that these are amino acid substitutions that increase oxygen binding affinity. But we'd rather have that sort of result than one that showed that it was completely uncorrelated with elevation. Right? So another thing that we can look at you know, in lieu of actually doing site-directed mutagenesis, maybe we'll do that at some point, is uh, where these substitutions actually occur on the hemoglobin protein. And we can compare the, the, uh, the positions of these, uh, these amino acids to the ones that were already identified for, say, bar-headed goose. And so that's what we're going to do is we're going to blow up this little square here and show that the amino acid substitution, the famous one for bar-headed goose, was here, position 119. And the substitutions I've just been talking about for coquettes and for brilliance are basically right in the same neighborhood on the, on the hemoglobin structure, suggesting, but not proving, uh, <clears throat> that these could also be implicated in increased oxygen binding affinity. And then finally, the last thing that we've been able to do that's uh, sort of an experimental approach is to look at the selection regimes 
on the specific amino acid positions, while well, at all the codon positions in the hemoglobin alpha that subunit, and ask whether or not some of these sites seem to, to be exhibiting signatures of positive selection, and if so, if it's the ones that are that we think are likely to be associated with increased oxygen binding affinity and high altitude lineages. So the method we're using is this uh, Gwindon, Hulsenbeck, and others method. It was published in PNAS in 2004. Um, this is a method that uh, uses the the now, I think, standard DNDS ratios uh, for each amino acid position to try to uh, detect whether or not there's a, a signature of positive selection. And so substitution between alternate amino acids are assumed to occur under one of three selection regimes, either purifying selection, where you wouldn't really expect to see substitutions, or neutral or positive selection, where you actually see a higher incident of, of, uh, of replacement substitutions than non-replacement substitutions. And that's basically what we're looking for, is signatures of positive selection in this system. And then the Gwindon et al. method switches between selection regime, regimes along lineages. Occur, um, these are occurring according to a markup process as part of the analysis. It's a detail we probably don't need to spend a lot of time on. And uh, it's a Bayesian approach, which is used to estimate posterior probabilities of each selection regime for each codon along a phylogenetic branch. It's one of the reasons why this is kind of a nice thing. You can actually look at this in a phylogenetic framework and see where the uh, you see transitions in, uh, in selection regime in specific uh, clades or on, in, uh, in particular lineages. So we'll look at some of the results. So we have 122 sites that appear to be dominated by strong purifying selections. So, so these are sites that don't show any changes. Uh, codon 1 is an example of this. When you look at this, it's all black, right? Which means that there's basically no hot spots there that would suggest that they're under positive selection. And uh, 11 sites have a probability of positive selection greater than 90 percent, according to this analysis. And we'll look at a few of those in just a moment. And so those ones will turn up on the tree, color-coded in orange or, or red. So here we see code opposition 9 again, which we talked about with coquettes. Uh, and you can see that there appears to be a strong signature of positive selection uh, in this part of the tree for that, at that position. Position 23 uh, exhibits uh, a strong signature of positive selection in brilliance. Position 31 seems to be hot all over the place, but uh, particularly so in coquettes and in mountain gems, another group but, that you can imagine occurs that uh, includes high altitude representation. And then position 117 is another uh, <clears throat> another codon that shows a strong signature of positive selection in coquettes again, another high elevation Andean group. So, as I said, these sorts of analyses don't provide direct evidence that these amino acid positions are actually conferring increased oxygen binding affinity. There are experiments that can conceivably be done uh, to prove these things, but all the data seems to be lining up in that direction. So we think it's certainly compelling. Um, <clears throat> there are compelling results, certainly more compelling than if we just didn't see any amino acid substitutions occurring in hemoglobin. <laughs> so is there zero sites that have any evidence of neutral? You know, I don't actually have that information before me. So the third part of the talk is the field physiological uh, part. Right? So we talked about the phylogeny, and uh, we, we did the chronogram, and we estimated that there were 11 invasions of high elevation habitats. And then we did the hemoglobin work, looking for signatures of positive selection and specific amino acid sites that might actually be implicated in adaptation to high elevation habitats. And now we want to know whether or not there is adaptation to high elevation habitats in these birds that we can actually detect through physiological experiments conducted in the field. All right? So we're going to talk about some work we've been doing with hovering metabolic rate, uh, which we've been measuring in the field, blood oxygen carrying capacity, which we're estimating based on things like hematocrit and hemoglobin concentrations in, in blood, and then uh, finally, the, what I think are the most interesting experiments, the resistance to environmental hypoxia uh, trials. We'll talk about each of those things, but before I get to that, I thought I would just take a minute to point mm -hmm. out that um, this really is field physiology as opposed to you know lab-based physiology, and where it's a little bit more difficult to work. This is the field site that we were just at about a, a month ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the Peruvian Andes, so this was at about a, at about 4,000 meters midsummer. You can see we're just a little bit below the snow line there. It was definitely extreme for me, <laughs> if not for the hummingbirds. And here we are setting up camp, walking our gear up the side of the mountain. That was particularly difficult for me when we arrived at this site. You know, you have to deal with things like how do you store your hummingbirds while you're training them to come to the feeder for your experiments and such. So you have to be creative and make little cardboard. Uh, hummingbird jails, as we call them. <laughs> and here's the uh, the field table with the centrifuge and the hematic hue and such. So we're doing all this stuff at a you know not in a laboratory environment. Here's Chris Witt measuring Patagonia gigas. That's a hummingbird, and it looks like a raptor. Those big wings. <laughs> <laughs> 
And here he is doing blood work, et cetera, et cetera. You're prepping birds. I have to point out that I actually prepped some birds, including this Patagonia, which is a, uh, yeah. Probably didn't come out that great, but you know. I prepped it. All right. So, um, so the three parts of the, you know, the three physiological components that I want to talk about are hovering metabolic rate, um, and then we'll talk about the blood work, and then we'll talk about the hypoxia trials. So um, we think that we, we wanted to measure hovering metabolic rate because this is clearly like a performance variable that's ecologically relevant to the birds, right? I mean, they're hovering while they're feeding. You can measure their metabolic rate while they're feeding, uh, while they're hovering at the feeder. Um, and it's an index that's potentially describing the demand for O2 you know, that might be driving natural selection on hemoglobin, right? It's not totally clear how we would expect VO2 to vary with elevation. This is something we want to discover. Right? But, uh, but there are relationships that we would expect with respect to body mass, as we'll see. So the way that we measure um, <clears throat> oxygen consumption, or VO2 hovering in, in, uh, in hummingbirds in the field, is by setting up a little enclosure. I'll back off and show you the larger <coughs> enclosure in just a moment. But basically, you have a feeder set up. The feeder, it's the same system that Robert developed for his Heliox work. So you have a little uh, you know, sidebar here where, the, where you have a tube that runs off to an oxygen analyzer. So the birds come in to feed. And if you, you have to train them to, to come to the feeders and to go all the way, stick their head all the way up in there so that you can measure the oxygen appropriately. And then you can just measure cons oxygen consumption directly while they're in there hovering at the feeder. And so it's the same sort of deal that was done in Heliox, but this time it's being done in the field in a normal, in, in normoxic conditions. And if you sort of back off, you can see the whole enclosure here, very high tech. Yeah. So you have this mesh enclosure. You've got the feeder here. Here's the mask. Here's the tube running up to the fox box that oxygen analyzer. The fox box is attached to the computer, so you're measuring the oxygen consumption in real time. There's a little light sensor in there so that it, you know exactly when it's actually at the feeder. And, <coughs> and uh, yeah, so which measurements are actually the relevant ones. And then they have a, you know, there's a mirror here, and there's normally a video camera set up so they can do the flight kinematics at the same time. And we do have some data although we don't have the analyses that I would most like to show you. So these are the results for um, uh, showing the mean VO2 for a bunch of species of hummingbirds that were uh, sampled across various elevations. And uh, the one thing that really jumps out at you when you look at the data here, the VO2 values, the mean VO2s, is that a couple of these species have much lower mean VO2s than the others. And these are both big species. The giant hummingbird, which is much larger than any other hummingbird, and then uh, Terrapini cyanopterus, which is like the second largest hummingbird. So all the other ones have much higher VO2s than uh, than these guys. And if you plot this out as a, as a regression, or if you plot it out just uh, according to, uh, to body mass, VO2 against body mass, what you see is that there seems to be a strong negative correlation with, uh, with body mass. So the bigger they are, the lower their VO2 requirements, which of course might have implications for hypoxia resistance as well. We can talk about that in a few moments. But that's all I have for you, not the analysis that we'd really like to see, which is the body size corrected uh, uh, analysis assessing the correlation between VO2 usage and elevation. We haven't done that yet, but that's coming along. But we can link body mass to um, covering metabolic rate. So the second uh, set of variables that we've been uh, measuring are, uh, are blood variables. So we're really looking for blood O2 carrying capacity. That's essentially what we want to get here. Uh, and so what we've been measuring in the field is uh, packed cell volume or hematocrit, right? which is essentially just the, um, the amount of red blood cells that you have per unit volume of blood. So it's like red blood cells versus plasma. Right? And I'll show you a little image of this in a moment. We also are measuring total hemoglobin concentration. You can do this with the hematoq. Uh, and we're doing red blood cell counts, although we don't really have those data in front of us because it turns out that they're really, um, it's really labor intensive to make those counts. We have all sorts of slides that are all prepared for can photographs of the slides, and they're all ready to be counted. But it takes like an hour a slide, hundreds of slides, like a thousand slides. And it takes an hour for, to, to count each one of them. So, uh, so Chris, who's doing the heavy lifting, as I said, hasn't really uh, gotten very far with that yet. Ultimately, what we're trying to calculate is the total quantity of oxygen in one mil of blood at saturation. Right? And this is a variable that needs to be taken into consideration when we're considering our hypoxia trial results. Right? If you want to know, these, these, these are all interrelated factors that we need to figure out a creative way to, uh, to uh, investigate or analyze uh, together. I can show you some results for hematocrit and hemoglobins. Right? These aren't uh, complete data because it doesn't include the data we just collected on our most recent trip. But uh, one of our findings is that the hematocrit values in hummingbirds are very high, and they're higher than the nontrochilids, so 0.57 versus 0.5. In humans, the hematocrit is like 30, something like that. And, um, and one, of the, one of the interesting results is that as you go to higher elevations within a species range, you see higher and higher hematocrits 
and, and corresponding, you know, uh, correlated higher hemoglobin values, hemoglobin concentrations. And so consequently, if you take lowland species that don't have other adaptations to high elevation, like they don't have amino acid substitutions in their hemoglobins, for example, like uh, that we've detected, like Utox Aries condomini here in Amazilia veridicata, and you bring them up to, to near their elevational maximums, and in this case, at least one of these two species was an was a elevational range extension at around 2,000 meters, their hematocrits go through the roof. And so the highest recorded hematocrits in birds were recorded in these guys with hematocrits greater than 70%. And you know, what that means is the blood is extremely viscous, right? Because it's mostly red blood cells, the heart rate <coughs> plasma there. So you'd think there would be a cost associated with that, but you know, that's what it takes in order for these birds to get by uh, up at that upper end of their elevational range. <coughs> so of course, this is, I would think of this as sort of confounding variation that we're going to have to take into consideration when we're analyzing our, hypo our hypoxia data, which I think will provide the ultimate test of uh, high altitude adaptation. But that's my point of view. I mean, Robert might not agree with that. Um, so the third set of experiments that we did were with hypoxia resistance. And the basic goal here is to estimate the minimum oxygen partial pressure values that are required for, hub uh, for hovering by hummingbirds across elevational gradients. So we want to sample birds across the uh, diversity of elevations and ask what, they can, what PO2s they can tolerate and still hover, right? which is, I think is a, a really good measure of, uh, of high altitude adaptation. So if you don't know already, I'm going to explain to you the relationship between PO2 and, uh, and elevation. Basically what happens, you know, oxygen, concentrate, oxygen percentage in the atmosphere is constant everywhere. At low elevation and high elevation, it's 20.9%. But as you go to higher elevations where barometric pressure is lower, there's less oxygen available because there's basically the molecules are more dispersed. And so it's more difficult to breathe at high elevation because of reduced oxygen partial pressure. Right? as opposed to a reduced oxygen percentage. So and there's a, a, basically a monotonic relationship here, where as you go to higher elevation, it just becomes lower and lower, oxygen partial pressures. So you get to a point where you know, humans can't live. Hummingbirds too, presumably. So we, can, we have some predictions for how hypoxia should relate to a number of uh, variables. So we would expect that, uh, that there would be a positive correlation between native altitude and hypoxia resistance. Right. You'd expect that birds that occur at high elevation would be the ones that are most able to uh, tolerate hypoxia and more extreme hypoxia. We would expect a similar, uh, similar relationship between hemoglobin concentration and hypoxia tolerance, because the more hemoglobin you have, the more tolerant you should be. It should be easier for you to, to uh, ventilate your tissues. Hemoglobin O2 affinity, similarly, if they have the amino acid substitutions that increase oxygen binding affinity, we would expect that they would be more tolerant of hypoxia conditions. And then we would expect body size to be positively correlated with uh, hypoxia resistance because we expect that the big guys will have a lower metabolic rates. And in the case of, uh, and so hovering metabolic rate is expected to be inversely related, which means that giant hummingbird, Patagona, is a species that has a lower VO2 hovering than the, uh, than the other hummingbirds might be more tolerant of hypoxic conditions because they have a lower metabolic rate. So this is the apparatus that we use to, um, to measure hypoxia resistance. Um, so we have this chamber. It's an airtight chamber, kind of like the one that Robert used for his Heliox work, which we can transport to the field, right? And uh, let's see, we've got a, a feeder in here. So the hummingbirds can come in and they can feed periodically if they're interested. We've got the perch here, and there's a little hole in the top of the apparatus. You can pull the perch out of the way, or you can twist it around if you don't want the birds to be landing on the perch, if you're trying to, uh, to test them, not uh, make, force them to hover. Um, we have a little uh, a line here, which connects the, the, uh, the gas cylinder, which is carrying nitrogen, right? It's a nitrogen cylinder, <clears throat> which is used to replace oxygen in the chamber with nitrogen, right? So that's how we, we uh, that's how we, we challenge the birds with hypoxia is by replacing oxygen with nitrogen in the chamber, right? Systematically reducing it. And then we have another little connector here that connects the one here and one here, where it connects the, the chamber with the Fox Box oxygen analyzer. So all the time you can you can uh, measure what the oxygen con what the oxygen percentage is inside the chamber. And there's a thermometer and various other things. But basically this chamber allows us to uh, reduce the oxygen availability for the birds in a very systematic way. It's pretty amazing actually. You can actually you can get it down to like almost 8.00% if you're trying to target 8% with a system like this. It's incredibly precise with the, with the, uh, the nitrogen tank. <clears throat> All right, so the basic methods uh, involve capturing birds in mist nets. That's the great ML, Robert knows, fantastic field guy that Chris found in a village in the Andes. Um, you train the birds to feed from a syringe. So that's a, one of the, one of the uh, I guess one of the challenges with, this, with these sorts of experiments is once you capture the birds right, in the mist nets and bring them into, the, into camp, you have to train them to feed at the syringe. And so some of the birds make it, some of them don't. Right? 
<clears throat> so you hand feed a lot of these things until they figure it out. If you have a little red dot there, you constantly wave it in front of their face to try to make them see it so that they'll know when they see it in the enclosure that that's the food. Uh, we, when we're performing the experiments, we then assimilate them to an, in the experimental chamber for two hours at 13% O2. We basically found that you can reduce them from 29%, 20.9% O2 to 13% O2 without causing any trouble for them at all. So that's the starting point for the experiment. And we let them sit in there for a couple hours to become acclimated. Then we systematically begin to reduce the oxygen percentage in the chamber by 0.5% every five minutes. And during each of those five minute intervals, every minute, we basically ask the bird to hover for four seconds. Okay? And if it can do it, that's great. If it can't do it, if it falls to the bottom of the enclosure and it can't get up again, then we basically consider that to be a failure and we record that failure value. So I have some, some video clips showing uh, some examples of hummingbirds behaving in our little chamber here. So um, this is an example of a hummingbird that's not really challenged by the, by the uh, oxygen availability in the chamber. And you'll see that it sort of, we toss it off the, the perch, and then it flies up, and it's sort of hanging around, and then it's like, oh, I think I'll go eat something. Goes up to the feeder, grabs some food, comes back down to the perch, hovers for more than four seconds, just doesn't seem to be bothered. One, two, three, four. Back to the perch. So hummingbirds are averse to the ground, almost all species, and so one of the one of the assumptions of our experimental design here is that the hummingbirds don't want to go to the floor of the cage. So they'll hover until the perch returns. So here's one where the bird looks like it's maybe a little more challenged, right? Like it wants back on the perch, but the perch isn't there, so it has to sort of fly around chasing the perch until it finally lands on it. Oxygen down to 8.08 percent. Okay. So that one seems a little like birds doing fine at eight percent, which is pretty good, right? Depending on what elevation the the, the uh, experiment was undertaken at. So <laughs> I'm just going to go back for a second. So see this chamber? The chamber I'm about to show you is slightly larger than this one, so that this chamber fits inside the other one. See how big the hummingbird is? All right. This is giant hummingbird now in the uh, in the chamber. It's huge. And uh, this is uh, an example of failure. <laughs> and then this is uh, the same bird. And uh, it's in the bottom of the chamber. So that bird ended up failing at 6.5%. So eventually, two or three times it did this, it fell at 6.5% at, at, at and then it flew back up to the perch. And then after like the third or fourth time, it hit the bottom and it didn't get up again. And so we consider it to be like knockout if it, doesn't, if it sits for five minutes in the bottom of the cage. But as soon as you take them out and you expose them to normoxic air, they completely recover, fly around, feed at the feeder inside their chambers. It's pretty cool. All right. So we can look at the data a couple of different ways. Um, this is way well, it's close. So this is, um, I'm almost done. So this is the sort of the wrong way to look at it, but I figured I'd show you the raw data anyways. So this is O2 percentage of failure. And uh, we've just, and it's not a, this is not the final analysis because it's not phylogenetically controlled. And we basically just lumped all the individuals from one elevation in the, and, and took a mean data point for that elevation. So there's some, some scatter around this, and I'll show you that scatter in a moment. But basically what we see is that the birds at low elevation, at 300 meters, suffer an aerodynamic failure. They can no longer hover at an O2 concentration or an O2 percentage that's actually fairly uh, substantially lower than what we see with uh, some of the higher elevation sites. Right? So at 300 meters, it's here. They fail at a, at a higher oxygen percentage at, uh, what's that, 1,300 or 1,400 meters. And then uh, similarly at, at uh, that's, I guess, 3,100 meters, and then, it, and then it goes down a little bit at 3,700. But just, you know, when you're sitting there doing these experiments, you have to think, like, what would happen to me if I was in the chamber? With the and so I found some data online that I thought were kind of funny, um, in a <laughs> morbid sort of way. So uh, if, if you subject humans to these sorts of percentages, so like that, that Patagonia gigas, we were at 4,000 meters. We weren't at sea level. That thing was able to hover at an oxygen concentration or oxygen percentage of 6.5%. Right? If you take humans at sea level 
and you expose them to 8 to 10 percent oxygen, then their symptoms include, if you can't read it, mental failure, fainting, unconsciousness, and ash-colored face, uh, blue lips, nausea, and vomiting. If you reduce the percentage to 6 to 8 percent, where we saw the, the, uh, the Patagonia hovering, you just stick a human in these conditions, 100 percent fatal if they're exposed to it for eight minutes, and 50 uh, percent fatal if they're only exposed for six minutes, and then four to five minutes uh, there can be recovery with treatment. And if you reduce it even further to four to six percent, coma in 40 seconds, convulsions, respiration, respiration ceases, yeah. So uh, the birds are pretty amazing, right? I mean, they can not just sit in the enclosure, but hover at much lower oxygen availabilities than what humans, you know, we're pretty wimpy, but we can deal with it. So if, if we convert these data to, um, to oxygen partial pressures, then we get a result that looks more like what we might expect, right? Which is that the high elevation lineages are actually better adapted to dealing with reduced oxygen partial pressures than are the low elevation ones. Um, but it's interesting because it looks like Maybe at the lower elevations, there's not really any sort of selection pressure on these guys. You can basically, it's just two points, but you get uh, basically the same value at 300 meters and at, at, uh, at uh, about 1,300 meters, where the, the uh, failure occurs on average at, uh, at like seven um, kilopascals. But then as you go to higher elevation sites, they become more tolerant of hypoxia. And at the highest elevation sites, they're even more tolerant. And from our most recent trip, where we were at 4,000 meters, I mean, I just did some like on the napkin sorts of calculations, but I couldn't modify the, the figure here. It, the dot comes out basically down here. So they're even more extremely tolerant than, than, uh, than the 3,700 meter site at 4,000. Now, you might be thinking, but what sorts of uh, oxygen partial pressures do these animals ever experience in their lifetime? <laughs> right? And they're much higher. You know, so we're challenging these birds with oxygen partial pressures that are equivalent to like 30,000, 40,000 feet, right? Much higher than the birds occur. Um, and so if you actually plot the green box here, actually indicate the partial pressures at those, uh, at, the, at those environments. And you have to also recognize that there's a break in the bar here, right? And so the scale's different on this upper part of the graph. So here we're looking at, you know, six to, you know, five to eight percent roughly. And here we're looking at 14 to 20 percent. So there's a big differential between what they experience in nature and what we're subjecting them to. And there are a few different ways that I think you can interpret this, right? You know, one possibility is that the asking the birds to hover is just not a very significant challenge. And the selection's not acting on their hovering ability because clearly there's something going on here, but they're nowhere near their, their margin. Um, <clears throat> and so it's possible that like burst flight and other things that are even more energetically challenging than hovering are really the targets of selection here. But another possibility that I that occurred to me while I was since I've been there and participated in the experiments is that you know, asking the birds to hover for four seconds isn't asking very much of them relative to what they have to do in nature. So it could be that, you know, hovering times for a minute or the amount of hovering that they would need to do in a day, you know, they'd never be able to do it in the, at those oxygen values that we've been uh, testing them under. And this just shows some of the, the actual scatter, some of the actual data points here. Now, <clears throat> at those elevations, so you can see that the, the data are pretty, uh, are pretty rough. Right, as you would expect from an experiment like this. And if you plot the values from 4,000 meters, they're basically like, you know, bringing that dot down, but still overlapping. You know, we wanted to point out this bird, and we'll also mention Patagonia again, as being sort of the extreme athletes in our hummingbirds. This is Oreotropolis. Um, I think this one's a Stella, actually. We have Melanogaster in the, at the field site on, on our last trip. These guys actually are, are occurring at oxygen partial pressures that are extremely low like around four kilopascals. And uh, we saw basically the same value for, for giant hummingbird. And in the case of Oreotrochilus, they have amino acid substitutions in their hemoglobin that would suggest you know, adaptation. Patagonia, at least the ones that we've looked at, don't. But it could be that it's the, you know, their VO2 values, the, their uh, lower uh, metabolic rates that actually allow them to deal with, the, with those conditions. So the hypoxia summary, Mount Everest, 8,848 meters, is not a respiratory challenge for hummingbirds. Right? at least from the standpoint of our experiment. Hypodense air, of course, is another matter, right? I mean, we're not reducing the air density, and if we were, they wouldn't be able to hover at those elevations, or most likely they wouldn't be able to. Um, White-necked Jacobin, which is a species that we sampled at 350 meters, can fly at an oxygen partial pressure equivalent of 10,500 meters. All right, so we're talking way up there, which means that even lowland birds can tolerate really low oxygen availability. Right? And giant hummingbird, and then black-crested hill star, Oreotrochilus melanogaster, um, fly in oxygen partial pressures equivalent to 13,000 meters. So they could, they could deal with the oxygen availability up there where the 747s are, right? But we wouldn't be able to deal with that. Uh, higher elevation species have higher resistance but live closer to their limits. Um, selection for hypoxia resistance seems not to be focused on avoiding aerodynamic failure, but rather on some other feature, unless, of course, we're just being a little bit too, um, 
tolerant with our four second protocol. And I could summarize, but I know I'm over. So I'm just going to, uh, I'll just stop there. Thank you, Jamie. So Including no need to run the classes. Uh, I'll back out and you can join me, but then I was going to ask questions. If uh, by any chance you'd like to watch, uh, re watch this on slow motion, uh, <laughs> it is filmed. Uh, so please ask questions of Jimmy, and I'm sure we'll be fine. Thanks, Craig. Sorry I went over. Absolutely great. Thanks. I got lots of questions. <laughs> Any questions? Bill, I knew Bill would have to <laughs> You can ask me what I can answer, Bill. Just to relate to your, to your last point, the four second limitation seems to be a really uh, important restraint on the interpretation. And I'm wondering if you're thinking about trying to get them to uh, fly for 30, 30 seconds or a minute or something like that to see whether they, they can be, they should be accumulating out to the depth. Like we over a period of time, maybe something there. It's more revealing than four seconds. Yeah, the four seconds, right. I mean, Robert, do you have anything to say about that from your Heliox experiments? So there's no anaerobic pathway in the universe. There's no anaerobic pathway, right? Oh, so like yeah, say, those are yeah. So when they go anaerobic, they do it for like a second, right? That was yeah, what Del no, found. That's it. There's yeah. just sort of pre muscle, but that's all of that. So that's part of it. But I think the, the other way to think about it is with the human experiments. So Del can see it. You know, humans can survive at sort of 12% oxygen, but of course, that, they're never found at 6,000 meters. So there's an excess capacity built into the physiological system. Relating to exercise, it's a function of intensity and also duration of the hands. And so I think that's kind of the, the effects that we're not teaching a part here. But as long as, you know, the statistical effects are pretty clear cut, and it obviously relates to sort of, you know, five or ten second shades rather than a four second shades. So I think that's the. I think the underlying pattern is actually meaningful, but the question is what's the direct target of selection? We don't really know that based on this sort of protocol. Well, um, do you guys try? Flying the high elevation birds at lower elevations, and is the is the you, is there a way to measure how much energy they're, energy they're expending while they're flying besides the oxygen? Is Maria Jose here? She just left. She just left because she was doing those. She tried to do those experiments with Patagonia, but I think they turned out to be difficult because the birds were difficult to transport in their. You know, without damaging the feathers and things like that. So I'm not sure that the experiment has actually been conducted. We've certainly talked about it. Is your has it been done? Did you guys do it? With Maria Jose. And you don't know the outcome? But there were issues with the feathers of the birds. Some of them, I think, got sugar on the I see. So the experiment was actually conducted <coughs> for one species. They would use just more energy. For minute or something. I mean, but the, the trade off with living at high elevations is just you spend more energy up there. I think there are lots of possible, or I think you would, but I think there are lots of possible outcomes, right? I mean, so for one thing, if these things are well adapted to high elevation habitats, like they have amino acid substitutions, mm -hmm. those would be great for them while they're at high elevation, but you bring down the low elevation and it's no longer a good thing to bind your oxygen too tightly. So I'm not sure what the outcome would be of that side of things. Okay, but maybe that's why Patagonia. Doesn't show amino acid substitutions because really they have a big well, elevational range. These are specific, you know, uh, studies of adaptation, low adaptation, low elevations, and maybe get their amino acid elevations. But that's yeah. that's the plan. That's been shown for rodents and such, right? That they actually have when they do the population genetic analyses within species, they show that there are transitions occurring along the elevational gradient. We have no idea at this stage for hummingbirds, <laughs> but that's why I mentioned that when we sequence these eight subunits for for uh, these eight globin subunits, well, the seven globin subunits and my globin, that. Uh, one component of this will be actually dense interspecific sampling within specific focal taxa that we think might actually shed some light on that side of it. Yeah. Any other questions? Does the oxygen particle concentration change at all with latitude? Yes, <laughs> only in the sense that gravity changes with latitude, but Earth is not perfectly spherical. So the effect is like 0.01%. That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> but it does vary with temperature and things like that, right? So that can have an impact on, on this. But some of these birds, you know, for you know, southern temperate latitudes are much lower elevation. I was just wondering, you know, 
It's a brilliant. It's not related to Patagonia, although people long hypothesized that it was. 